Hello and welcome to a fresh episode of NBRI New Business and Retail Insights from the Center for Retail and Studies, Mays Business School, Texas A&M University. I'm your host, Venki Shankar, Director of Research and Coleman Chair Professor. It's my honor to welcome our guest today, Professor Moran Sir. Professor Cerf is a rock star in many ways. He's a neuroscientist and business professor at the Kellogg Graduate School of Management and at the Neuroscience Program at the Northwestern University. He's also a member of the Institute on Complex Systems there. Dr. Serve holds a PhD in neuroscience from Caltech, an MA in philosophy, and BSc in physics from the Tel Aviv University. He holds multiple patents and has published over 60 academic papers in journals such as Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS, and the Journal of Neuroscience, as well as popular journals such as the Scientific American of Mind, Wired, and the New Scientist. His work has been featured on CNN, BBC, Bloomberg, NPR, Time, and MSNBC. He has a huge following through his public talks at PopTech, TED, TEDx, and Google Zeitgeist. He's won numerous awards, including the prestigious Presidential Scholarship for Excellence. He was recently named one of the 40 leading professors below 40. Uh, Dr. Cerf is also the co-founder of BQ, which applies neuroscience research to help society. He's also the Alfred P. Sloan Professor at the American Film Institute, where he teaches annual screenwriting class on science and films and is a consultant to various Hollywood films and TV shows, including Limitless. Now, I can go on and on. His bio is Limitless, but let me stop here. And thank uh, Moran for joining us. Thank you for spending your uh, valuable time with me in this conversation. How have you been amid this trying COVID-19 times, Moran? Thank you, Venki. Uh, you know, it's, it's a strange time because uh, I'm a neuroscientist, so I have kind of a medical background, and I'm a business professor. And the two things people are worried about right now is either health or economics. So I get both. So, you know, my family calls me and says, like, hey, what should we do? Should we do this or that? Journalists call me either to talk about, like, what do I think is going to happen to the world health-wise or business-wise? And I don't know any of them in terms of, like, predicting the future. I can tell them some things. So what I do mostly is I go myself to the CDC website, to the uh, World Health Organization website, and I just kind of listen so I can say the same things two hours later to a journalist who calls me. That's my day now. Okay, you're being too modest, but... You know, uh, since you are very much in demand, uh, let me ask you to describe yourself. How would you describe yourself uh, in maybe five words or less? Uh, I think that uh, the, I would say I'm a, a, here's the five, here's three words. I'm a neuroscientist, business hacker. So I think that the, the key thing that, that informs my work right now is that I used to be a hacker for many years in the Israeli intelligence and as a kid. And then I left this career as a hacker and moved to academia, uh, first to neuroscience and now to business. But I still carry this uh, bug in my mind. So, so I think that those three kind of categories really reflect who I am. I, I think about uh, you know, how to study the brain and so on but always how about tinkering inside like a black box that you have to go into and stuff like that. So that I think are okay. the three words that I use. That's excellent. Let me add one more to that, rock star, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, the reason I call you long, the rock star is you just seem to be doing so many things seamlessly, uh, effortlessly almost. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very rare to see somebody who blends all these different skills. And you mentioned hacker. So tell me something about hacking and the connection to neuroscience. So I should say, first of all, to the audience now, I remember, uh, because it's a, a podcast and we're recording it, uh, I speak extremely fast. If I had to choose another word, I would say fast. Uh, 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 so if you think it's running too fast and you have a buffering issue, it's not. It's actually me speaking that fast. So uh, <laughs> it's not something on your computer. It's actually the way I speak. And I can uh, attest to that because the first time I heard you speak, giving a... Uh, delivery. One of the persons next to me said, uh, I know he's a genius, but I just cannot follow what he's saying because it's too fast. <laughs> right. So, so you're going to have to play it in like double slower speed. Uh, maybe it's going to work. Um, so I think the hacker thing is uh, 
it's a world of, of, of knowledge on computers and a lot of knowledge on humans. So I think that being a hacker requires understanding how computers work, but mostly it requires understanding how people work. Uh, I'll give you concrete examples. Uh, one of the hacks we did when I was uh, still working in, in this world involved trying to hack into a big telephone company. Imagine like AT&T. And uh, we did a complex things where we tried, nothing worked. Then ultimately, at some point after we failed, a person uh, called the, uh, the kind Hotline. of the, 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 the person, like the, the woman who's in charge essentially of the kind of uh, network from, from uh, the company and told her, I'm a technician on the street and there's a cell tower that's not working and I want to get into it and fix it, but I need a password. And she, like a good like, kind of headquarters person, says, absolutely not. I'm not giving the password to anyone on the phone. This person keeps bugging her and says, please give it to me, please give it to me. In the end, she says, absolutely not. And she hangs up the phone, even though she's taking a risk because it means that if it's true, there's going to be uh, you know, area in the US that has no reception for the next, say, 24 hours. But she does the right thing. She doesn't give the password. And the morning after, she gets a call from the chief security officer of this company telling her, you did a great job. Yesterday, hackers tried to get into the system. They pretended to be technicians on the road. They called you. They kind of forced you and pushed you and used everything. But you stood your ground. You didn't give them the password. It's a great thing. We want to actually uh, highlight this case in the newsletter to the entire company. I want to ask you a few questions so we can put uh, this kind of information in the newsletter. And he asks her questions about her background and so on. And while they're talking, the company gets hacked and all the records are being stolen. And it turns out that the person who called her on day one to kind of convince her to give the password was me, pretending yeah. to be a technician on the road. And, and indeed, she didn't give it to me. But also the person who called it the day after was me pretending to be the chief security officer. And one of the things there, and then she gave us a little information that we needed to actually hack into the system because she now was very happy to be the glorified hero. And the right. thing here is that it's basically based on research. We have a lot of knowledge that people are really, really good in defending themselves when it comes to information. But once they uh, stood the attack, they managed to stop the attack, they lowered their guards, and then the next one is the one that's going to get you. Uh, and that was kind of what we used in order to basically try twice and the second time get into the system. And it's based on my understanding of the brain. So the brain works the same way. When someone bombards you with information, uh, let's say a marketing company is trying to kind of bombard you with uh, messages and you're saying, I'm going to actually not let this influence me. I'm going to kind of be skeptical and I'm going to uh, work to understand the uh, truth behind it and investigate myself. And you do a good job in doing that. And the day after a friend tells you you should buy this thing, say, oh yeah, I'll definitely click uh, on the button. I think that that understanding is uh, at the core of how humans work. And being a hacker allowed me to understand how humans work and now apply that to understanding the brain, why it's like that, and to marketing, how can we use it if we want to change people's mind and so on. Right, that's a great example. Uh, give us an insight into your research journey. I know that you spent like 10 years in industry uh, and then suddenly decided to do a PhD and then get into neuroscience. Tell us a little bit. Yeah. I, I was journey. kind of a child of the 80s, so I grew up with computers, and you know, when computers had more stuff, I learned how to operate those things. I remember the days where you know, kind of monochrome screen became colorful screens, and like many colors, and, and when a hard drive became a thing. So I, I was kind of growing up with those things, so I had a lot of knowledge on how it works, which lent itself well to me being a hacker back in the 80s. I was then recruited to the Israeli intelligence as a soldier, uh, age 18. And then I was exposed to maybe 20 people who all had the same knowledge I had. So together, we were kind of a team that hacked into bigger things with infinite budget because that's the army and so on. So that was kind of my you know, venture into this yeah. world, which I think is a lot of similar to uh, uh, research. You actually have to use statistics and you have to uh, trial and error uh, and kind of understand what's behind the logical. So I, this was that. And then I basically started a company in the world of hacking that ran for a number of years and at some point became public and kind of did well. And then I left and I said, what now? So, you know, we are taught to plan life up until to, you get to this point, but no one teaches you what happens then. Yeah. And so then I kind of had to ask myself what I actually care about, what I actually want. And it became obvious to me very quickly that what I care about is, is understanding psychology of humans and that there are only certain ways to do that. And one of them is to poke directly in their brain. And I was looking at ways to do that. And I learned about one a lab in the US who was studying uh, the humans, uh, the, the brains of an animal called human uh, in a way that I didn't know uh, you can study, which is opening the brain of a human and putting electrodes inside. So most neuroscientists study humans by looking at imaging data, like something that scans the brain from the outside and infers what's going on, on the inside. And this one lab in uh, California was actually working with patients 
who were undergoing brain surgery for clinical purposes, and during the surgery, putting electrodes inside their head and studying thinking from within the brain. And I said, that's amazing. This will be, you know, accessing the vault the way, you know, the way hackers do, like really <laughs> going in. And I joined this lab, I applied to school, I went to grad school, but quickly joined a research that was all about studying humans from the inside. And once you study humans from the inside, you can actually answer the biggest questions about right. life, free will, uh, where is consciousness, how do emotions work, can you regulate them? So I, I could keep, really tackle the interesting questions. And I did that for uh, nearly seven years. And I started to see that a lot of my work uh, had applications. Like, and I really cared about that. Like, I, I enjoyed not just doing the research, the neuroscience, but also going there afterwards to someone and say to a hospital and saying, here's how you can actually implement it. And at some point, kind of uh, one of the colleagues of mine at Caltech said to me, you know, if you care about that, there is kind of a, a, a niche that's opening right now for neuroscientists in business schools where you actually talk to companies and you help them apply their work in the real world. And I said, you know, light bulb. That's definitely what I want to do. It took some time because it's, it's still novel and a lot of kind of schools are hesitant and, and a lot of companies don't know what to do with that. So I had to spend a lot of time kind of building the, the you know, kind of, I don't know. The connection. Yeah. To convince people that it's useful and gradually did this move that I'm now five years in where I teach MBA students and companies how to use the brain in their business. Excellent. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of your research, particularly your recent research. I know you've done quite a bit of work on consumer neuroscience mm -hmm. and, and now the interplay between AI and neuroscience. And uh, also, more recently, I saw a paper by you on blockchain, too, mm -hmm. and the connectivity to neuroscience. So take us through any one of those research streams and Tell us some of the interesting insights that you learned. What's cool in neuroscience right now? So I think we have like three cool projects that I, that I feel, I right. hope and believe are going to be kind of in people's mind in the next couple of years. That I think it's a good time to highlight. One uh, looks at dreams. So dreams is this fascinating thing that everyone, you know, is interested in. And, and, and for the last millennia, uh, right. we were interested in them and, and talked about them, but we didn't have access to them. We couldn't really see them. We had to wait for you to wake up and tell us what you think was in your dreams. And people actually, as we learned, are many times forgetting their dreams. And if they don't forget, they also are not accurate necessarily in describing them when they wake up. So now, because neuroscience allows us to actually look at the brain while you're sleeping, we can actually extract the dreams and see them. And the research shows how this can be done. But the second tier of work that I'm look looking at right now is, can you actually treat a dream like a commodity? Can we actually use things like smells or sounds that we do to you when you're sleeping to actually navigate your dreams. And here, the interesting thing is that we can actually influence dreams, but the more interesting things for the audience, I think, is that we can actually, via the vehicle of the dream, can actually influence your awake behavior. So we can do things to you when you're sleeping, and then because your guards are down and your brain is still active and listening, we can actually nudge you in different directions, such that when you wake up, you have no memory of the experience, but you still behave differently. So we can start to see if we can make you eat healthier when you wake up just because we did something to your brain when you're sleeping or make the, the, the classical work, not by me, but by a colleague of mine, show that you can take a person who is smoking and tries to quit but fails and do things to their brain while they're dreaming that makes their brain see smoking in a different light such that when they wake up, they don't want to smoke anymore. And this opens up a new commodity. It's like an entire right. new this, you know, canvas. This almost sounds like the movie Inception where they are trying to influence yeah. dream, but they also have dream within dreams and layers yeah. of dreams which may be uh, more fiction. I don't know whether it's real or not, but uh, this opens a fascinating possibility in uh, business, for example, entrepreneurship, in um, marketing, for example, can influence people's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, this is externally, I think you talked about externally, but what about uh, the dreamer himself or herself influencing their own future? Have, can they control, can they, uh, can they will themselves, since you do a lot of research on free will and consciousness, uh, how, how do you see that research uh, playing into that space? So I think, I think we're kind of threading carefully in this world because people can, but we yeah. don't know what the consequences are. So we're really kind of gradually, slowly taking people and saying, okay, let's try this, let's try that. So the answer is that about 12% of the population have this magical power called lucid dreaming, where they can actually wake up in their dream, but still stay asleep. So they, they regain consciousness, but they're still dreaming. And they can do things with their kind of, movie 
They can navigate the direct the movie of their dream. Suddenly, you know, they can choose to fly and it works and so on. And now the question is, can you use that to actually change something in your mind so you rewire things for the better? And, and you know, if you can think about healthcare, you can think about uh, the use uh, in PTSD, for instance. So people uh, who suffer from experiences when they're awake use the fact that their brain is under their control to actually start navigating memories differently and reshaping them. It has a lot of applications. And I think that we're really touching the surface there because it's such a new field and unclear what are the risks of doing that. So we're really doing it a very, very careful way. But that's, I think you asked me about like kind of what I'm excited about. I think I'm excited about that because I feel it opens up a new canvas. So I, I'm not going to be surprised if in 10 years, Amazon offers you, uh, you know, you can kind of uh, order a movie by Amazon Prime and you can see either uh, the movie when you're awake or a movie for your dreams, like Spielberg directing your dreams. Or if a uh, company start marketing to you when you're sleeping. So you actually say like the brain is there and I want to kind of use that platform to access that. And I think the reason I think it's important to talk about it right now is because right now we're just working on it and it's not proven as a working thing, but I already see problems with that that we should think about right now and decide if we want to allow this. So I think that the, the audience they should ask themselves, do I want it? Do I want to kind of have someone else access my brain and toy with it when I'm not there to guard it? And I think that is the time to talk about it before the scientists prove that it's possible entirely and it's becoming like a you know, product. Yeah, this is very interesting because right at this stage, we are debating about the intrusion of, uh, of Alexa and Alexa and Home, uh, Google Home, and all those smart speakers, and now you're taking it one step further and saying, what if you know there is a, a device or there is a, a product out there which actually can manipulate your brain? Uh, we which- saw once the CEO of Netflix, I think it was, in a conference, and he was going to talk about like, and he said something that stuck with me as a sentence. He said, uh, "I'm not worried about uh, YouTube and Hulu and you know cable networks as a, as kind of competitors. The biggest competitor for Netflix is sleep." And, uh, and, you know, he was, he was saying it kind of partially as a joke, but I think he's after onto something because if you're starting to take more and more of our attention and use that to convey messages to us, then sleep is, you know, we spend a third of our life sleeping and no one's using it for nothing. It's just our brain, you know, doing homeostasis. Like we definitely uh, can see this happening. So I'll tell, tell you about one more project. Yes. Because you asked about the AI. I'll tell you about one yeah, more cool yeah. that I'm really excited about right now. Uh, we have now a project that tries to uh, quantify intuition and see if we can actually, and that's still a neuroscience business project, it asks the question, can we use the part of your brain that you don't have full control over to solve problems for you? So I'll give you an example, concrete example. Uh, right now you feel temperature. So somehow you know the temperature. For that to happen, your body had to have billions of cells kind of measure each and every one the pressure and temperature in its own uh, location and then send it to the brain. The brain gets billions of data points from all over the, the body and aggregates that and you just feel it's 70 degrees. That's all you know. Like you somehow feel it. You don't really know all the processes that happened between the moment your body felt something until you just kind of had the experience of the temperature, which means your brain has tons of processes that take information and do complex heuristics on that without you being involved at all. Now we ask, can we use those processes to help you solve problems, for example, in marketing without your awareness of that? So an example that we can use from a colleague of mine is one where he gives people a vest that they put on their body. And this vest has a bunch of uh, pressure motors on the body. So you kind of turn it on and you feel something on your body. You feel like pressure on your uh, right side and a little pressure on your chest. So this happens. And so he turns it on, you feel for a few seconds the pressure, and then he asks you for this feeling you had right now, What's the right choice, to go left or to go right? There's a kind of tablet and two arrows. People say, I have no idea. I just felt something in my body. So if you don't know, just make a guess. People say, okay, I'm guessing left. And he says, correct. The right choice you made right now earns you a dollar. Let's try again. Turns the vest on. Now they feel something in their back and in their lower chest, let's say. And again, two arrows appear. And the question is, for that feeling, is the right answer to go left or right? People say, this time, right. And let's say they are told again, you earn a dollar. So for the next 45 minutes, you just feel things and make choices. And people start making decisions, left or right. Sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes they're correct. In the beginning, it's kind of like a guessing game. They they win some, they lose some, and so on. But after some time, they get better. They start being more accurate. They kind of say, for this feeling, definitely right. For that feeling, definitely left. And they start actually earning money. So we see that they learn something. They don't know what they learn, but they learn something. And what's interesting is that the feeling on their body what actually is triggering this feeling isn't just random pressures of motors, it's actually the S&P 500 
turned into a feeling in their body. And what they're doing is actually making a buy and sell choices. So they're actually learning to trade in the market based on feeling. And what he shows in this little kind of mini experiment of his is that people are really, really good, better than chance, in just learning how to use this part of the brain that takes feelings and makes right, them into right. a decision and solve problems. And I think we're trying now to do the same thing with marketing. Give marketing managers lots of data in different forms and see if they can do better than if they get the same data on a big table with a lot of information. If somehow they can use the brain's power to find meaning in complex data and solve problems just by filling them. I think that's, that's kind of, you know, that's cool. A lot of things. You know, the interesting thing is this is uh, almost got a parallel in machine learning and AI, right? Exactly. Which right. is basically training on data. Initially, in the, in the machine uh, learning algorithm is poor. Then once you feed in more and more data, it starts getting predicting better and better. So is there a exactly. parallel in terms of approach? Uh, I know that, you know, you work with single cell neurons and uh, here, you know, they are trying to use deep learning where multiple layers uh, is there any similarity at all? So you got it perfectly right. It is indeed the case. It's basically what I just described is kind of what machine learning is. You give a lot of examples to a machine and you let it make mistakes and it kind of converges to the right answer. I think the, the key thing is this is how the brain learns. So when we call it machine learning, we're kind of stealing from neuroscientists because machine learning is how the brain learns applied to machines. Right. So we just take it back, uh, kind of reclaim it and say, AI is doing a really good job. Let's see if we can harness what AI is doing and bring it back to the brain and use the brain's ability to do that. And that's what the brain does all the time. When you're a baby, no one teaches you with heuristics how to see. No one says, hey, Venki, you should uh, take photons that come to your eye and do Fourier transformation and call this the yellow and call this blue. You just get bombarded with information and you get positive reward when things work and negative when it doesn't work. And you learn over time to see. Your brain kind of tries things until it finds the right transformation and it calls it seeing. So now we're saying if the brain is so good in doing that really, really fast and really, really accurately, let's try to take problems and feed them into the brain in the same way and see if the brain can do something that actually beats machines. So the question is, machines are so good at it because they can do it really, really fast. Are there some problems that humans can do even better than machines? And I think that's kind of the race we're at right now. Machines are so much better in so many things. There's something that humans are still better. Can we really find out what is those things that humans do better than machines and give humans the power to do more of those? That's an excellent description. But I've heard that uh, generally, having spent a lot of time with AI researchers, is that even though the uh, deep learning algorithms try to mimic your brain, they're not exactly doing it. They are basically brute force and we have this holistic view of thinking uh, in our brains that is somehow not yet um, mapped into the deep learning algorithms. We probably need a new paradigm. I don't know. But uh, what, what is the latest uh, in neuroscience on that? Is there something in, that goes on in our brain that cannot be easily replicable by machines? I, I think that what we learn is that every time we try to interface the brains and machines, we do the best we can with machines and the brain does even better. So I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, there's people who lost their hearing, became deaf over time. Uh, for a while, this was basically the end of your ability to hear. But in the last couple of decades, we've become better and better in building cochlear implants. Those are devices that basically you put where your ear is, and you, on the one hand, have a toolkit that basically turns molecular vibrations into compression of air, the way the ear does. And on the other side, you basically feed the signal into the brain. So cochlear implants are on the one hand, do what the ear do on the outside, and on the other hand, they do what the brain does. When people built that on the first place, they said there's no way we can actually replicate what the ear does because the ear has wiring that go into the brain in a specific way, and as long as you don't do exactly the same thing, the brain's going to get bombarded with signals, and it wouldn't know what to do with that. And then they just tried. They just built a cochlear implant, and they just basically plugged it into the brain in a different way than the way the ear works, and they just blasted the brain of a deaf person with signals that came from the cochlear implant. And what they saw is that within a few months, the brain relearns how to hear. So the brain says, okay, now the signal comes this way, not this way, the way it used to. Okay, I'm going to adjust. And the brain is really, really good in like recalibrating itself quickly. And after a few months, people that have a cochlear implant learn to hear again. They never get to the 100% that they were before, but they get to 80, 90%. So they just regain hearing because their brain learns to do what we don't know how to do with machines. So we know how to get machines to that level. It's not the level that the biology is, but the brain is adaptive enough to say, okay, you got here, I'll help you. And the brain does the gap automatically oh, without us doing anything. And I think that's where the two kind of work together. How about in vision? Uh, has the same been tried in vision and any progress on that? A paper came up, I think maybe three weeks ago, 
uh, with the first kind of report on the same thing with the uh, sight. So they took people who were blind and they put retinal implants that basically take photon and turn them into the language of the brain and just blasted the brain from the back with a, a lot of signals. And after a few months, those people start seeing shadows and colors and so on and they regain their sight. It takes a little longer and it's, the accuracy is not as good, but you know, this means that blindness is Could potentially be cured, a curable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that, you know, I'm not really religious, but uh, as far as I can tell, the last person who cured uh, blind, uh, you know, Jesus was uh, getting a lot of credit for that. So uh, he gave sight to the blind. So, you know, we're playing in the same domain right now of nice. God. But that, that brings us another fascinating uh, topic, which is basically, I know you, you're an advisor on, to several of these companies, uh, the concept of augmenting human capabilities. Right? Mm -hmm. These are the examples that you've given are people for people who have lost sight or a sense of hearing. But what about you know, enhancing our brain power? Uh, that, that raises a whole bunch of ethical issues, as you said before, in, in manipulating dreams. But what, what about the physical idea, a physical possibility or uh, accuracy of that? So, so you 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 hit it correctly. Like the, the issues that we're kind of struggling with are not just the kind of mechanical engineering issues, but also the how to approach this problem. The field itself is called a sensory addition, the ability to actually add senses. Uh, with humans, it wasn't done. The only thing they do is they restore lost senses back. But with animals, there are a few trials where they take an animal and essentially feed new data into its brain with a new plug and play device, plug and play device, I mean the hands or the eyes or the, the things that speak, speak to their brain, and they see that the brain can actually uh, embrace those. So if you think about it like philosophically, nature is full of brains that are connected to different devices. So the brains of humans is connected to the eyes and the ears and the nose and the skin, and that's kind of, that, that's the interface for humans' brains. But that's not the only one that biology has. Like bats, for instance, they have a brain, but instead of eyes, they have echolocation. So they uh, use sonar basically to kind of uh, bounce back from walls and from devices, and that's how they see. So their brain speaks the same language as our brain, it's the language of chemi chemistry, but the interface to that brain for the bat is echolocations. And birds have in their head uh, magnets that actually uh, figure out the magnetic fields of Earth. So birds always know where is north when they fly. So they have in their body a different thing that feeds into their brain and they just feel the magnetic fields of Earth. And, and animals are full of those different things, but all of those things at the core have a brain that speaks the same language. So because we know that the brain speaks the same language and it's just different biological devices, we can imagine taking the eyes of the bat, plugging, the, plugging those to the brain of a I don't know, bird, and giving it enough time, and the bird, the bird will just learn to not just see with its eyes, but also to feel the, uh, you know, environment, environment yes. or, or stuff like that. And and then you can imagine imagine doing it with humans. I think that uh, I think that the, the challenges right now are both uh, technical, but mostly ethical. Like, do ethical. we even want to do that? Right. So in that context, you know, the neural link in Elon Musk's initiative, they made some pilot uh, studies which showed that uh, at least. If I put some electrodes or rods and hardwired to your brain, then uh, at least if you're paraplegic or some kind of a uh, you know disadvantaged uh, person, then you can make your limbs move. Uh, do you think that's uh, really a, a consistent uh, feasibility for the future, or is it just a proof of concept? I, I think it's. I, I'm hopeful in the sense that I think that. All, all the efforts by all the companies, Elon's is one, and a number of competitors are doing the same thing, academics and none. Right. And I think that what they're aiming at right now is uh, fixing a lot of disabilities. So deafness and blindness and being a paraplegic, those things are kind of what they're after. And some of those are physical and some of those are also mental, like Alzheimer is another version of a disability that is kind of horrible and looming around us that we're now making strides in trying to stop and to slow down or change something. So I think all of those efforts are aiming at things that we kind of all can agree are good. Like we all can agree that taking something that is a function that was lost and restoring it is good. Where it becomes murky is getting new functions and uh, like giving humans the ability to see behind the wall or to right. be 
powerful to lift a piano and so on. There, the questions are two. One is kind of, should we start playing with nature and, you know, and be, play gods, like we said in the example with Jesus, like play gods. Right. And the second one is, what does it do to uh, equality if you actually do that? So, so if, right. if Elon Musk is rich enough and he can afford to give himself the brain of like, you know, 290 IQ points and those who are not rich enough cannot, then suddenly you have inequality, not in money, but in IQ. Yeah. And this is a different world. And, and you know, there's like philosophers who talk about like taking it to the extreme, you can actually fork to two species. Like if really, you know, if, uh, the, the difference in, in, in DNA between us and apes is 2%. So the right. smartest ape out there is only slightly different than us. And still the, you know, the difference in IQ is tremendous. Like, you know, we take the smartest ape out there. We say, look at this one. It's so smart. It behaves like a three-year-old baby. It can do uh, symbols and basic language. We're so impressed. Let's put it back in the cage. The new species of humans might think the same about us. Right. Look at this, say, uh, on Stephen Hawking. He can do differential equations in his mind, just like two-year-old Timmy here. Uh, it's, it's, you know, they might put us in cages and give us bananas. So I think that they, I think this is like the question that we have to think about. Like, do we even that, want? That's to a fantastic uh, uh, point that you test on. And we also are struggling with AI ethics too, to a certain extent. How do how do we develop even machines that are uh, ethically motivated, and we've had our ch own challenge of ethics already. But when it comes to business applications, clearly, you know, you see a, a first healthcare application, a lot of it, you know, mm -hmm. has immediate impact, particularly for disadvantaged people. This would be a boon, trying to get them back the lost organs and, um, you know, capacities. But um, what about uh, in the space of, uh, you know, managerial decision-making, you said, you can make managers make better decisions. They don't have to really guess a lot. And then, you know, what about consumers? Now, consumers are currently, you know, using smart speakers and assistants, virtual assistants to enhance their ability to better choose their products and services. Do you think that cons there will come a day in which, uh, not too far from today, where people will start getting assisted by all this technology, so it'll become very hard for businesses to really understand what consumer behavior is all about because now they'll be enhanced and assisted. I, 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 th I think you, you hit all the points that are, that are kind of ahead of us that, that need to be discussed. So I think that uh, on the managerial side, I think that man managers always have made to, to make decisions and they're kind of, that's their, that's their talent. Right? The talent is being able to make the right choice at the right time. That is what they're getting paid for. And more and more, we can help them make better decisions or find tools that will basically help them or replace the decisions. And I think that the best thing that neuroscience is doing right now for managers is we help them learn about their brain profile. So what we're learning basically is simplified the version of saying that is that every person has his or her own brain profile that we can maximize and help them know better. So for example, Yuvenki might be uh, fantastic in thinking under stress in the morning when you're hungry. But I might be terrible at that, but really, really good uh, two hours before the deadline with a bunch of people next to me that give me advice and uh, when I'm full. Uh, and someone might be better when they're very, very kind of uh, sad and one person might be better when they're... So what we're learning is that there's a lot of profiles and it's not like there's a correct one and incorrect ones, but if you know yours, if you know that you're best in these moments, then you can kind of align your environment to give you more of those times so you can make better decisions. So what we're doing right now with a lot of managers, we're just saying, give us your brain for a few hours. We're going to test you under all kinds of scenarios. And we're going to give you basically a kind of a score sheet that tells you, you are best at A, B, C, D in those times with those people and in this condition. And then you can try to maximize that. And step two for that is not just to work on the individual, but also on the team. If you have a board, we can say, let's scan all of the board's brains and tell you as a board when you should have your meeting or who should be in the room or who should speak in what order. And this is kind of a way to essentially optimize the communication, the interaction, and the decision-making of either a team or an individual. So that's on the managerial. And on the consumer, a lot of the work we do right now is basically trying to uh, figure out what uh, happens in the brain of people when they watch content that actually leaves a mark that penetrates because that is engaging so when you watch a movie some movies you leave them and you think oh my god this was <laughs> incredible something happened there something kind of uh, the director got me she made this movie as if it was for me or you leave a concert and you say whatever mozart did hundreds of years ago somehow spoke to me right now perfectly it was the perfect concerto for this moment how did he know who i would be hundreds of years later so, so something 
happens there when good content meets a brain. And up to now, we kind of could call it art or experience or engagement. We had names for that, but they were very kind of murky and fluffy. So by putting electrodes in the brain, while people are exposed to a good commercial, to a fantastic conversation, to a uh, unusual kind of experience, we can see what is about the brains that kind of work with that and help the people who make the content align with more brains. So we can help Picasso paint such that many people are going to appreciate it, or Mozart, or so on, or Red Bull make the best commercial for the Super Bowl. That's kind of what we're looking into right now, consumers and managers. Excellent. As you're talking about connecting the mind to the content, right? Uh, and on that regard, you know, you're taking it one step further of the concept of computational advertising or personalized advertising, which is all about understanding what your tastes and preferences are. You mentioned Netflix, Amazon, all of these are learning using machine learning algorithms, your past preferences, and then trying to tailor that. But what you're saying is taking it to a next level based on your science profile and then trying to give you an exhilarating experience, uh, which will resonate with you and make you engage more, right? But yeah. that would be a hard task on an individual basis and a consumer. I can understand when you say managers, you know, build a profile. There's a finite number of managers every firm has, so every firm can uh, afford to do that. But let's say a Procter & Gamble, a Red Bull company, the, uh, marketing, they have millions of consumers. How do they, how can they go about, uh, are there any groups or segments that they can uh, uncover based on some studies that they could be used uh, constructively? So the answer is, yes. Yeah. So first, first of all, you, you, you said it correctly. Like with technology, we now can micro-segment to the level of individual. Right. Like we, we can know so much about you that we, we can actually say there's a segment of one, maybe not even one, but like maybe you in the morning is a different segment than you right. in the evening. Exactly. Maybe we can just say like, like, say like a, you know, you after you had lunch with your girlfriend uh, at home is different right. entirely than you with Or your... post-COVID and pre-COVID, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they already, they already are going there. And what we're basically saying is we can help those companies by uh, replacing the word you with your brain and replacing the kind of conscious you with all of your brain, including parts that you don't know anything about. So, so where, where we are is we basically say, give us enough readings of your brain when you're experiencing different situations, watching a movie, talking to your friends, reading a book, sleeping and so on. And you're going to build a profile of your brain that then can be used to tell a company or you what you actually want and how better than you know yourself. So it would be the, the, the creepy part is that I think it's going to be better than you know yourself. So, you know, when I was a kid and I studied philosophy, we studied about uh, the Oracle of Delphi that had this uh, sign that says, know thyself. And back, back in, you know, in, in Greek philosophy, the idea is that the virtue of life is to actually explore yourself and know yourself. And if you, if you really do a good job in philosophy, you will actually get to the inner version of you and you understand what you want. And, you know, over the years, it took different turns. Now we have therapists who help you know yourself. You can go and you talk about yourself and they help you. Or you can do art or meditate. There are many ways people use to actually get into their inner soul. But the reality is that there's big data that does it better than anyone else. And it's no longer a privilege. It's a race. So now uh, Facebook and Google and Amazon, Twitter, they're in the business of knowing you. That's what they do for, for a living. So if you don't do it, they will. So they will know who you are. And now we're kind of trying to create toolkits that will allow people to at least learn themselves in the game. In, 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 right. in the game. Like, okay, okay, I want to study my brain so I will know that I'm more likely to buy something at 2 p.m. when I'm hungry than, and, then, and then I can have, you know, either know that I'm doing it because of my kind of biases or maybe stop them if I don't want to be that biased, or, but at least have a fair shot in a race where you're one and they're infinite. Right. So that, that's kind of where we are. That's fascinating. You're almost connecting all these to spirituality, which is knowing the inner self, understanding the inner self. And sometimes that's so complex that even you cannot uh, do it yourself. You need the help of all these other tools. Um, tell me a li little bit, let's change track a little bit. Tell me about what you do other than these exciting stuff uh, for just fun. If you want to just relax or do, uh, what, what are some of the things that you'll turn to that's so not many things. related I mean to your work? You're catching me right now in a, in a strange time where I actually uh, where I'm trying to write a book, oh, a popular great. book. What so is it? So right on? now, my fun every time every time I manage to block the world, I sit for a few kind of hours if I get to in front of a computer and try to uh, write and not science at all. Uh, really, kind of, and that to me is is the most fun because we're as academics 
trained in writing, but in a different, different way of right. writing. Where kind of, as boring as it's possible, can, as, possible <laughs> as short and concise as it can be, and everything has to be backed by someone else saying it before you, that you're climbing on their shoulders. You cannot like, just say something because you think that's true. Like, the world is that without having, so suddenly having to do that, it's so much fun. Like I really, I, I, I go with So what's this book about? What's it on? It's, you won't be surprised. It's, it's about uh, hacking and a brain. Okay. Uh, and it's kind, of a, it's, it's kind of a detective story uh, in a world like ours. It's not like science fiction in any way, but it does uh, make the point of, imagine that all the things I'm working on right now became a reality. How does it work? So, so oh, it's, okay. It's, so it's, it's a, like a, a science fiction futuristic Okay. It starts with, I can tell you, I can tell you since I, I don't know how, who's watching it, but like, uh, I, I, I almost like can riff off. It starts with a person who is dying uh -huh. and this person comes back in chapter two and it speaks to uh, a research that a colleague of mine is doing right now where she shows that you can actually take a brain of a person who died at noon, extract the brain out of their uh, body, put it in an aquarium and basically run kind of dialysis and keep the brain functioning for a few hours after the person dies and still ask them questions. So she did it, I should say, not with humans, but with pigs. But the point is that we're now playing neuroscientist in a field that is so creepy and strange where you can basically talk to a person hours after they died. So the book starts with that and basically suggests what happens when you can still talk to the person who was killed in chapter one and ask them for clues on their own matter. Wow, that is fascinating. I'll, I'm really looking forward to. Can I sign up for your book? <laughs> Comes out, I come back on your show, and we'll. And we'll uh, yeah, it'll be fantastic, and uh, I'm sure everybody will be thrilled to read it. I know that you advise a lot of shows on, uh, and then we talked briefly about Limitless. Are there any shows that you are currently advising, or uh, anything that's uh, about to come out uh, in terms of the entertainment world that? Uh, I can't say too much, okay. but I tell you that a few days ago, I had like a, a, a gathering with the people who wrote the, the film Contagion, which suddenly got a lot of popularity right, right, back in 2011, again. but it kind of came back because it's predicting so well what we're going to write now. And there was a conversation about kind of what, what's next. So this film was done nine years ago and predicted really, really well right now. Right. If you were predicting right now, 10 years ahead and wanted to make it into a film, what would it be? And the answer in two words is climate change. That's the... Sorry, say it again? Climate change. Climate change, okay, that's, great. That's the story that's of... That's the next one, okay, great. Uh, but uh, I, I'm fascinated by that. I'm sure the viewers and uh, listeners will be very, very interested in knowing more about it. Um, tell us what should uh, companies be doing differently now that you know they are hunkered down and post-COVID, lots of companies are uh, furloughing employees, laying off people, they are, some of them are surviving, in, especially in retailing. A lot of brick and mortar stores are struggling to survive. Uh, how should they be thinking about it? What, how can they take some of your insights from neuroscience, marketing, business, and other fields? And what could they be doing differently? That's a tough one. So I've, I've, I'll say one thing that I think uh, is an opportunity that I, that I suggested to my friends who are in, in the retail world. So, so I... I Bigger than that, I think, is harder for me. But I said, if you're forced to not really kind of scale up, if you're forced to not, uh, then it's a good time to invest in research and development. So that, that, that's one thing that I said. And I said, research and development could be, could be depends on your field, could be uh, at a very you know, basic, like just kind of creating reserves for different days, but it can also be knowledge. And I told my friends, few friends of mine, that are basically unable to work right now because the businesses rely on people entering a store and they can't do it. I said, let's have a weekly session where I will do the job of like looking at what's known, what's new in business and tell you. So I will, I will talk, I, I will take my kind of skill as a scientist and just share with you. And this would be well, an investment in you as the CEO. And I think in that sense, what you're doing right now is exactly that. Whoever right. is plugged into your show right now is doing something that they can do even though the world is kind of closed, they, they're preparing. That's, that's the very least. So I think we're used to knowledge kind of being disseminated in university, during the MBA, during undergrad, and kind of stopping afterwards. There's no chance for most people to actually get into a classroom and see you talking about work and so on. If anything, now is a chance to do that. So that would be- That's the, an the excellent, least. excellent advice. On the same note, many of the viewers and listeners of this show are also- either entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs. 
And uh, so what are some of the new ideas that they can take from? I'm sure I, I have taken a lot of ideas already, but uh, what are some of the other ideas that you can suggest that they could, um, you know, being a co post-COVID situation where we know uh, social distancing will be there for uh, at least for a while and human contact will be much minimized and uh, technology will be, you know, ramped up. What are, what are the things that they can do? So I'll, I'll give you an answer. It might be boring, but I'll still work with that. Sure. I think that uh, we have a paper that came out maybe a year ago on entrepreneurship and the brain. And it tries to kind of, it basically the experiment was Shark Tank. We had investors on one right. hand whose brains were scanned. People come, present an idea to them. So the entrepreneurs are the, now, the one side, the VCs are the other side. We scan the brains of the VC. We try to see if we can predict by looking at their brain what things they're going to invest in. So classical entrepreneurship experience, uh, uh, elevator speech, and someone kind of saying thumbs up, thumbs down, but we look at their brains. And we try to see if we can predict by looking at their brains what would work. And ultimately, if I had to summarize this entire paper with a lot of like, things we played with, what works beautifully is uh, if the entrepreneur is able to communicate well his or her idea in simple words, quickly, it works. So the one skill that I would recommend any person in any field to learn right now is communication. I think we don't really teach that as much. It, there, like, there's a school of communication, but to our MBAs, we don't really have a, a class that is about how to stand on stage and give a talk. And more and more, I think this becomes a, a necessary thing. Like I think Steve Jobs wasn't just a great CEO and manager. He also knew how to stand himself on stage and sell the products every quarter because people want to be like him. And I think uh, professors are now not just required to do research that is good and submit papers. They actually are required to go and communicate it really, really well. It's part of our job to actually know how to deliver the message really well. And, and of course, politicians. It used to be politicians could be, you know, just statesmen. Now they have to be good on TV. Like, like all the candidates we have right now for any office, they're also are kind of measured by how well they are in front of an audience and on TV. And I think this is the one skill that I would suggest for anyone to invest in right now, hone and become perfect in being able to communicate to VCs, to entrepreneurs, to your family, to your friends in a very concise way that speaks to their brain correctly. That's excellent. That You yourself is an outstanding example of that communicator. Uh, are there any other last uh, minute uh, advice or suggestions that you like to give to uh, uh, any messages for the society as a whole? Could be, you know, you mentioned some things about ethics and you also briefly alluded to future uh, movie being a, a, on climate change. Any message that you want to leave uh, the viewers and listeners with? That's big, but I, I, will, I will use this opportunity. So, so thank you for even kind of bringing sure. this. I think that this is my personal bias, but I think that the leaders of the world right now are businessmen. I think that governments across the world are thinking on their own country, not on the entire global world. And they're mostly thinking about the next two years, four years, six years. They're not able to, by virtue of how it works, really think about the next 20 years because they're, they're kind of, their frame is shorter. And they have to abide by a lot of laws that stop. I think businesses have a horizon that's much bigger. They can, they can, they can do things that, that leaders of political uh, form cannot do. That is why you see that uh, the CEOs of Google are thinking about inhabiting the moon or landing on Mars much more than politicians. This is why you see a lot of companies thinking about dealing with a lot of things that politicians cannot afford to think about because it's, it's a different- Short-term kind of orientation, yeah. And I think therefore, I think that the people who are in your audience, they are the ones that I think should guide the world uh, as it kind of looks ahead. And I think that the research I'm talking about today touches on things that I myself am not sure are good. So if we can manipulate your behavior while you're dreaming, we can use that to make you not have bad experiences, not have bad memories and eliminate PTSD, but we can also use it to sell you more Captain Crunch when you're sleeping. And I, think that, I think that you guys have the power to decide where it's gonna go and to either elevate it or stop it. And I call for every person who's a business person to spend, let's say a minute out of every one day of meetings saying, is it something that I would want uh, to experience as a customer? Like if I do that and the world becomes like that, this is a Kantian approach. If this universal moral happens, like if what I do, everyone did, would this be a world I want to be in? 
And if the answer is no, then maybe even though it's not necessarily good for your bottom line, I would say work a little bit to change that. Excellent. That be the call. That's a fantastic message. And that also is very uh, resonates with uh, our school's uh, one of the uh, you know taglines, which is advancing wealth prosperity. So okay. you really uh, nailed it uh, in, in the last. And thank you, Moran. You've been a wonderful host. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And uh, hopefully the listeners and viewers would want more of you for your busy time sometime in the future. But thank you so much. Thank you, Venki. That's a pleasure.